Two girls go missing for 40 years, then someone spots a suspicious car. Cheryl Miller and Pamela Jackson, two high school girls, were traveling to a party on May 29, 1971, when the people they were escorting took a false turn. They turned around, but when the car's driver looked back, Cheryl and Pamela's car's headlights were no longer visible. Local law enforcement took up the investigation right away, but years of searching turned up nothing. Though there was much speculation over what happened to the missing girls, it wasn't until decades later that officials actually discovered the truth. The initial stages of the inquiry revealed anomalies. Cheryl and Pamela didn't drink before getting in the car, according to the people they were following. Prior to meeting the group, they had been visiting Cheryl's grandma in the hospital. Furthermore, they vanished without leaving any tracks or evidence of a collision, and there were no signs that they had left the road. Although it appeared as though they had vanished without a trace, in rural South Dakota in the early 1970s, cases of missing children didn't prompt the massive manhunts of today's order of 100 people. The youth of this new decade have adopted the liberated attitudes of the 1960s. Many youths who vanished were merely assumed to have packed up and moved to California. Jim Roynhorst, a former Clay County constable, noted that back then, if a child went missing, it was actually much more likely that they were a runaway. Only not very often did you hear of kidnappings of children. In South Dakota's rural areas, you simply weren't concerned about it. Some others in the neighborhood agreed with the hypothesis, but those who knew Cheryl and Pamela felt they weren't the runaway kinds. They were described as down-to-earth by classmates, and according to Cheryl's older sister Kay, she left the house that night with only a pocketbook. Because of this, even when the local sheriff's office reduced the scope of its search, the missing girls' families and friends persisted in their efforts. Cheryl's father spent hours each day driving back roads, urgently screaming out for his precious daughter and her best friend as they searched every ditch and gully in the county. Authorities periodically visited the region as forensic technology advanced over time in an effort to find any sign of the girls. They dug up the gravel pit and used metal detectors and ground-penetrating radar to look for their car. The two were on their way to the party, but nothing was discovered. It wasn't until 2004 and the establishment of the South Dakota DCI cold case team that a breakthrough in the investigation was made. According to rumors, the party's location wasn't too far from the farm where one of Cheryl and Pamela's classmates had grown up. David Lycan, a serial offender who was 14 years into a 225-year jail term, was that classmate. Lycan was the main suspect once investigators started focusing on him because of his violent past and proximity to the spot where the girls vanished. Authorities searched the Lycan farm as a result since David's younger sister allegedly saw family members destroy a significant amount of evidence their years earlier. A brief search revealed she was likely correct. Several bones and two hubcaps were discovered buried beneath the property's sewage tank. Rubber gloves, personal stuff, letters, and women's clothing were all seized. In the farmhouse, a lone red purse was discovered hidden. Lycan's charges were swiftly amended to include the demise of Cheryl Miller and Pamela Jackson, and shortly after that, a prison informant recorded Lycan confessing to the executions. The case appeared open and shut, then it fell apart. The confession had actually been faked by one of Lycan's fellow prisoners and the items taken from the farm couldn't be directly connected to the two girls. Even the bones under the septic tank turned out to be those of butchered animals. With no concrete evidence to go on, the charges against Lycan were dropped. It was now 2008 and authorities were no closer to uncovering the fate of Cheryl and Pamela than they were 37 years prior. Fortunately they wouldn't have to go for another four decades before the real truth came out. In 2013, a local fisherman walking along Brule Creek stumbled upon a large shape sticking out of the water. He moved closer expecting to find a few rocks or some discarded trash, instead he discovered the underside of a rusted car jutting out from the mud. Authorities moved to pull the car from the creek, which they soon determined was a 1960 Studebaker Lark, 
the same make and model of Cheryl's car. A person side investigators found everything from loose change and house keys to photos and letters from friends but one look at the faded driver's license told authorities everything they needed to know. Given that it belonged to Cheryl, the two missing girls' corpses were found inside. The 42-year-old cold case was finally solved, but there was one glaring question that needed to be addressed by the authorities. What happened was that the car was in third gear when it crashed, and damage to one of the wheels suggested that a tire may have exploded, according to an assessment of the car. Investigators believed the vehicle had popped a tire, off the road and landed in Brule Creek submerged. 